Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Chief Development Officer for the MTA, Jano Lieber. Good morning. Uh, I am going to provide you a little information relevant to the signals challenge that's been presented to all of you. As you've heard from the governor and other speakers, the goal of this entire undertaking is to quickly increase the capacity, reliability, and throughput of our subway system. And now I'm going to show you, uh, in just a moment, I'll show you a video that talks a little bit about what we have now. But obviously, signals are vital because they control train movement and determine how many trains can operate in the system at the same time. So here's a little video to talk about the system that we have right now. The goal of the MTA Genius Transit Challenge is to increase the capacity of our subway system while also reducing breakdowns and delays. The capacity of our subway is largely regulated by our signals. Signals tell a train how close they can safely get to the train ahead of them. Today, nearly all of our subway lines are controlled by an older, fixed block signaling system. We've used fixed block signaling for the last 100 years. In fact, many of the signals within the system today date back to the 1930s. But fixed block signaling doesn't allow us to increase the capacity of our subway system. And because it's so old, its components are failing, leading to widespread delays almost daily. Fixed block signaling works like this. Rails are divided into blocks, and electronic sensors track trains that occupy those blocks to keep trains a safe distance apart. When a train is detected in any part of the block, that block is considered occupied. The signaling system keeps trains a safe distance by prohibiting movement to an occupied block behind the end of a train known as a buffer block. This safe distance is enforced by stop arms, which activate train brakes if it tries to move into an occupied block or a buffer block. It's a very safe system, and it has served us well for more than 100 years. But there are limitations. First, the system does not provide precise train location or speed monitoring capabilities. Not knowing exactly where a train is means we can't safely operate them more closely together, so we can't increase the number of trains when we need to, like now, when we are experiencing record ridership. Secondly, the fixed block system is very complicated in terms of infrastructure. It takes a massive number of signals, cables, power, and other equipment to operate the system. Any of these can break down, and when a component fails, all signals affected by the component's failure turn red and stop train movement until the component can be repaired or replaced, causing delays for everyone. The subway needs modernized signaling that offers better reliability and the precision monitoring that would allow trains to travel together more closely and with continued high levels of safety. Being able to reduce the space between trains will allow us to add trains during peak demand increasing passenger capacity and decreasing crowding. The infrastructure required for modern signaling is also much simpler. Less maintenance is required because there are fewer components, but the current situation mandates that we must move quickly. Our subways are at maximum capacity and our outdated signal infrastructure cannot support our ridership, causing a cycle of breakdowns, repairs, delays, and frustration. So clearly, replacing the MTA subway system signal system is a technological and logistical challenge. But you, the community of global innovators, have addressed challenges like this before. You took us from the gramophone to the iPhone, from the Model T to the Bugatti. And we're hoping that you can take us from a system that you just saw described in the video to something much, much better. For this exercise, we've established seven objectives that must be met in order for us to have the kind of signaling system we all want. Let me go through them one by one. Train spacing, safety, compatibility, cost, reliability and resiliency, power and space constraints, and installation time. First, train spacing. You heard a little bit about that just now. 
The signaling technology, whatever we move towards, must minimize the space between trains, just thus maximizing the number of trains the MTA can put on a track at once. The technology would detect other trains and maintain a safe separation and vary that distance based on the speed and position of each train. Second, safety. Needless to say, we need to comply with all the relevant federal regulations that govern signaling, especially computerized signaling systems, and those are codified at uh, 49 Code of Federal Regulations for those of us who will have to dig into that, uh, that regulatory system. More broadly, the signaling system that we move towards has to assist us in make, maintaining a safe speed and in automatically preventing overspeed. The technology also needs to communicate information about the train to the rail control center so that corrective maintenance can be scheduled. This is what we refer to as the check engine light feature of a proper signaling and train control system. So as to minimize on-track breakdowns and also to avoid delays. Third, compatibility. Uh, maybe more than some of our uh, other great world systems uh, that you've heard about today, New York has a lot of uh, tracks, that, uh, lines that operate on different tracks. We have that flexibility from, to move from one track and one line to another in many, many places. So as to maximize the flexibility of our system, the new technology should allow different cars to use different lines and different tracks to the greatest extent possible. Fourth, cost. Cost is always a factor. The general statement is the cost to install a new technology for signals has, uh, and to maintain that system, the maintenance is a feature of cost as well, of course, must be cost reasonable. As you've heard today from the governor and others, there's a commitment to invest substantially in the system, but obviously there's a great deal that needs to be done with our capital program so that the cost is always going to be a factor. Reliability and resiliency. The new signal system needs to be adaptable to new technology. We have to be able to, to upgrade the software while minimizing the need to change equipment constantly. And it also has to include redundancy measures that make sure the subway service can continue in the event of the failure of a single component. And of course, security. The system has to be designed to really high security standards that will detect, prevent, and report unauthorized access and unauthorized access attempts. Resiliency. This has to be a system that can prosper and function well in a New York environment. And that means enduring exposure to our weather, very high temperatures, and very low temperatures, which are exacerbated in the tunnels, and prolonged exposure to our freeze and thaw cycle, moisture, rain, snow, salt, and all the other features of a New York operating environment. Power and sp space constraints. This is very important. The technology has to be able to function within the available trackside space, including in tunnels and in, our, in the outdoor areas of our system. Here's a, a section of a typical cut and cover structure in the New York, in the New York system. It's 210 square feet, but once you deduct for the area of the, uh, the clearances necessary for the train to operate and to maintain personnel access in an operating environment, it's much, much less spade. It's very, very tight. There you have the equivalent in a typical tube construction, even tighter. We need to address that with our new signal system. Power constraints. We need to upgrade uh, the entire system's power infrastructure in order to allow us to operate more trains. It's fundamental. But the signaling system that we move towards needs itself to be as energy efficient as possible. Finally, installation time. That's been a topic of discussion throughout this morning. And needless to say, rapid, rapid, rapid. We can't wait any longer to grow our capacity and reliability and throughput. And the new system needs to be uh, able to be installed 
in that kind of time frame. So you see the seven objectives that we've set for the signals challenge and that we hope that all the submissions we receive will address. But let me talk for a moment about what the MTA has been doing in the area of signals. In 1994, an MTA study concluded that communications-based train control, or CBTC, was the best available technology to modernize our signal system. And I think, as, as many of you are aware, CBTC is a technology that uses a moving block system instead of a fixed block system, the, the current prevailing standard. CBTC relies on radio communications and a network of sensors and receivers to track the position of trains and also their speed, and therefore to allow them, as we said, to operate in closer proximity. So far, the MTA has installed CBTC on two subway lines, the Canarsie Line, or L, the number seven, or Flushing Line, and the Queens Boulevard Line, which accommodates the ENF trains, is under construction right now. Unfortunately, the current approach to deployment and installation of CBTC is just taking too long to meet our city's needs. And as the governor alluded to, the current plan, for a variety of reasons, is now scheduled to take 45 years to fully deploy throughout the entire system. That's just too long, and we need something much faster. Some of the constraints, however, that have impacted on deployment and the pace of installation are, are ones that I ought to share with you. For example, there are about 12,000 train control signals in the New York City system, over 15,000 track circuits, 2,600 plus switches, and 325,000 signal relays. That's a lot of uh, equipment to address. In addition, we have uh, 200 plus interlockings. That's the, the system that allows trains to move from one track to another. And those interlockings require four times as much signaling work than regular straight line track. And they also require very large rooms to store equipment 24-7 operation has, as folks have talked about this morning, been a challenge to uh, the improvement of the signaling system because, in effect, it's prioritizing continued operations over accelerated deployment of a new, more modern signaling system. And as we are deploying, we are still needing to maintain the existing, albeit antiquated, fixed block system, and that is taking time, it's, it's using up time for our outages, and is also slowing deployment of a new system. So thinking about CBTC, although it has been deployed successfully, as I said, on a couple of lines and is moving forward on others, it is a system, a technology that was originally developed in the 1980s, and that's a long time ago from a technology standard. So uh, we, we wanted to both acknowledge that the current state of affairs is not working, but, and here's the punchline, challenge you, all the smart folks in this room, uh, to, to take one of two approaches, either to help us to identify a new technology that will meet all of the objectives we've laid out for this signals challenge, or to identify an alternative CBTC approach that can and will be more rapidly deployed. Throughout the, uh, the audience today, there are people who are experts in signaling. They have red tags on them. They're a very handsome group, as you can see from their photos. And we hope that at the end of the event, if you're interested in talking more about signal specifics, you'll find them and engage with them. Thank you.